the next presentation, uh, while I plug this in, I'm gonna is a bit of a, is a bit of a um, <coughs> a bit of an outlier. So there's a group called the Open Source Radio Telescopes. I was in I, I'm in frequent contact um, with them, but I'm not actually a core member. And I asked them to you know come to FOSDEM and, and talk about their work because I think it's just really good good stuff that they do, and like it just fits it perfectly into FOSDEM. But they couldn't. Um, they couldn't get funding for like sending anyone out, so I said, okay, well, I'm not an expert on what you do, but if you, you know, we can come up with a good presentation together, then I will just do it on your behalf because I just want to get the word out there. Um, yeah, what's happening? So, <clears throat> the, like, my name is on here because I'm <laughs> giving the presentation, but um, Evan, Ellie, and Richard were the people who actually put this together, sort of as part of their um, initiative, um, you know. Marketing material, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so that's that. Now, open source radio telescopes. What is this actually about? So um, it's a bit of a different group than the, the other people that we've seen here. Um, so the the idea is to um, provide, you know, designs and instructions for doing uh, radio astronomy with the intention of introducing them into sort of the education system, like making this become an easily accessible teaching tool. And now the idea is not necessarily to train, like, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people to become radio, or radio, radio astronomers, but rather to get people interested in engineering and, you know, DSP and all those things in general. It just happens that the people who started this um, project, they're all astronomers, or like some are professionals, some are hobby astronomers, and um, they're all in, interested in sort of education. It's, and it's, and it's a, it's a, um, it is, is a good, um, what do you say, like uh, field to both like build simple experiments that are still very, very um, impressive, but also, um, you know, to do some actual engineering work. So that's sort of the general idea. And un, uh, like the, the express intent is not to sort of reinvent the wheel, reinvent the wheel, but rather use GNU Radio, for example, where possible. Just use cheap and easy things wherever available, and then focus on actually making it available to educators, for example. Okay, so this is some of the things that um, Open Source Radio Telps are currently doing. So there's this a 21 centimeter horn antenna project. Um, you can um, map out uh, hydrogen lines that way and actually like draw a map of the galaxy. I'm going to show um, some pictures later on. A, a small loop antenna, which um, has a different um, uh, application. So those are sort of two sort of practical things that sort of came out of this project as like something you can do. It you know, has instructions and all of that. So um, these are sort of projects and this is sort of the process so there will be you know more and more instruction manuals um, and, and, and you know kits and all of those things um, to m made available um, yeah and like like I said earlier so RTL STR dongles can radio are sort of some of the main tools okay let's take a look at those two projects that I just mentioned and um, yeah let's talk a lot by, about them and um, yeah, this is this one is what they call the small loop antenna. Um, so you can um, you can see it there on the left. You can see this isn't. I mean, this this is a pretty capable piece of hardware, but it it doesn't look like it's very difficult to make, and it's not. That's the whole point. So um, if you take all the parts together, you end up with about hundred dollars. It's a bit of an estimate. Um, I, I you know it took a couple of iterations to sort of figure out an easy way how to do that. Um, so yeah, the actual antenna is, I think I might actually have, I have some more information here. The actual antenna is basically a, um, you know, a long wire. Um, there is a tuning part, so um, ham it up uh, effectively, and amplifiers. So um, yeah, so you, you start off with just basically a frame, and um, so the, the, the geometry matters, but like the exact um, carpentry doesn't does really not um, so you you wind a, a wire around it and that's pretty much all you have to do and then um, then you need a little you need some electronics and that's you know where the where the like where the fun starts I guess so um, this is an amplifier and, and some and some filtering 
and um, a ham it up is used to then, oh sorry, okay, ham it up is then used to move the, um, the signal into, uh, into a frequency range that is receivable by the RTL SDR. So why do you need to ham it, ham it up? Because the idea is to um, track VLF signals. So um, VLF is um, used by, uh, by the Navy for communicating with submarines. Um, so you can you can think what you want about the the the, the, the world's armed forces, but they give us a lot of high-powered um, transmitters to play with, yeah, like like with the <laughs> the passive radar. Um, so VLF is you know is, is, is pretty high power. I mean, so the point is that you have like this one big um, transmitter like somewhere, and you don't give away the location of your submarines because it's it's just basically available everywhere. It even penetrates water to a degree. And one thing it does is, uh, so, so VLF goes everywhere. Um, and one thing that radio astronomers do, I, I don't know if they do it all the time, but this, in this experiment it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice, neat effect, is when there are solar flares, um, the ionosphere changes its, uh, like its charge level. I don't know if that's the correct physical term, which has the effect that a VLF signal sort of bounce, o bounce off the ionosphere earlier than they usually do. So for those who've taken like ham exams, you are familiar with like these terms, but these are layers in the ionosphere. So for reference, if you do HF bouncing off the ionosphere, they usually do happen in this area, F1, F2. Derek, is that correct? <laughs> and uh, VLF um, bounces off a little earlier, and when you have solar flares, even more so. That means if you have a solar flare, the um, received uh, power to your monitoring site is higher. So. And using that small loop antenna, you can measure that. So when it actually, the kit includes all the software as well. So just quickly, so starting from the antenna, which is just the wire, the amplifying circuit, which you have to assemble, the ham it up, going in, putting it into an RTL STR, you end up now in software, um, doing radio for some pre-processing, and then there's another Python program that is sort of part of the OSRT kit that will then produce your graphs. And the graphs look, what? Where's my graph? Hmm. No, um, uh, I, I think I just m miss, miss something. I think I just, I, I, I was reordering the slides and I think I did, I did something wrong there. So um, actually, you know, I'm just going to stick to the order, um, improvise a little, and I apologize for misrepresenting the open source <laughs> radio telescope um, project. So um, the, uh, we'll see some results about that. Um, the tools that were cho chosen, like I said, Kino Radio, um, RTL SDR, uh, were, were evaluated. So SDR Sharp, for example, is another one that was evaluated. So um, it's, I don't know if you've used it, it's one of those tools that you just like fire up and then it, it immediately gives you nice GUIs, whereas Kino Radio is more on the um, like sort of reconfiguration um, side. But then, like, like I showed earlier, for the actual final project and radio came into play. But this is an interesting thing because it, um, like it, sho like it shows like the, uh, the steps people have to go through um, for, for, for starting Gnu radio. And if you want to make a tool that is very easily accessible, and we're, t we're not even talking undergraduate students, we're talking like middle school students here, um, you have to make sure that you don't put in any pitfalls. So as someone who's representing the Gnu radio project, that's you know, a good sign for us to make sure that we um, keep things uh, simple. Okay, so um, the DSP is very simple. It's just FFTs, basically. Uh, I don't really want to go into it because, a in the end, we just plot everything into a into a, a waterfall. Um, this is the flow graph, so nothing crazy in there. Um, like FFT is like the the, the craziest, uh, most uh, you know DSP intensive block in the ent entire flow graph, and that's that's saying a lot. So yeah. And now, finally, we come to the results that I promised to you earlier. So this is just a very long recording using the small loop antenna. Um, this, is, this is like 24 hours, so one full day. And I, think it's, I, think, I don't think you can read it at the back, but um, these are sort of annotations where the, sort of the signal power went up, and it did coincide with solar flares. So, um, yeah, so... I didn't know this either, but um, as you have like sunrise and sunset, like the the um, uh, you know the, the reflection angles actually goes down, which which are these these dips here. So, um, but.
But this is nice. And like you can, it's not like those just randomly happen, right? There's like forecasts for this kind of thing. So you, so if you're like into the whole radio, uh, sorry, um, radio uh, ham radio scene, then you will you will know that. And so that's a good good time to set up an experiment like that. So more elaborate is the how much time do I have, um, Marcus? I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got plenty of time. I thought it was like one minute for a minute there. Sorry. Okay, the horn antenna is a more elaborate project. So it's also a little bigger. Um, you can see, like, you know, a laptop for scale um, here. Um, this is, um, involves a little bit more carpentry. <coughs> the um, uh, sort of electronics part of it is um, yeah, it's a, bit more, it's a little bit more um, evolved at this point. So the um, what, what basically what you have to do is you have you have to um, like I have another picture showing from the front, but you have sort of a waveguide here, so you need to make sure that this this gets appropriately captured. So you don't have to um, do the the ham it up stage in this case because this is will I'll, I'll show you in a minute will be for detecting the hydrogen lines, but you have to make sure that you have the signal properly amplified and you know matched and all those things. But in the end, you end back in the SDR dongle. Go to GNU Radio, run a Python program over it, and take a look at the results. So, in that respect, it's it's very similar. Okay, but why? Like, what's the difference? Like, why do this project, not the other one? Um, so, this is something you can use to uh, measure the hydrogen lines. So, this uh, if there's like if you look into the galaxy and there are areas with more hydrogen, like some nebulae or something like that, um, they will emit energy, and you can just figure out where they are by pointing the horn in different directions. <coughs> Fortunately, the, the planet we're on turns around, so that gives you a, a good view. Also, you know, this is just a, you know, a more elaborate project. Can, can also mean, you know, more satisfaction for people. Maybe people do the small loop antenna first, and then they want to build something a little bit more interesting. Um, yeah, and then, you know, this is a more, you know, more, just, just a slightly more elaborate project, yeah. It's also a bit more expensive. Um, so Evan, who's one of the authors, like commented they're sort of trying to sort of improve the kit to make it a little cheaper. Um, so with $250, it's like, you know, maybe slightly outside of the budget of like some kid who just wants to buy the kit themselves, but it's still a very reasonable price. Plus you get to keep the antenna. It's not like, um, this is something you can, um, can't reuse or anything. So slightly more difficult, um, but also more interesting. So yeah. Um, here are some pictures from the actual construction, so you have to sort of build a scaffolding frame, whatnot. Um, this is, you know, some boards and dry, drywall. I'm not quite sure what it is, like, obviously with reflective material and, um, yeah, so waveguide, lo low noise amplifier. Um, just put it all together, um, following the schematic I showed on the, on the first slide. And um, there you go. So um, this is a, um, an FFT plot of the actual signal, and you can, like, here, I don't know if you can see it, is a, is a peak, like, just above the noise at 1.4 something gigahertz, and that's where, that's where the hydrogen line is. So this is, this is pretty cool. You're basically looking at the galaxy at this point. And uh, I, I can totally understand how that would, um, you know, fascinate people. Like, even if it's just this line, it's like, this is, you know, like space and everything. And <laughs> so, so really, really fantastic. Now, if you um, align this with uh, some information about where you're looking, you get pictures like this. Um, so, you know, we don't have a measurement for every single spot on this graph, which is why you have these, these curves. Um, but I, I, so I don't know how familiar you are with the, the galactic, uh, what's it like, coordinate system. I actually had to look it up myself, but basically, uh, you know, the galaxy is mostly flat. So you have one, um, one dimension, which is basically the, um, the the angle between the sun and the, the center of the galaxy. So you'd expect, and, and the other one is like going going upwards from the galaxy. So you'd expect as you in, increase the the latitude to see less stuff because there's just no no hydrogen there, and then yeah, that's exactly what we get here. So, and as you sort of sweep around, you can you can sort of um, correlate this with position of celestial objects that like emit hydrogen lines. So, yeah. Um, personally, I find this uh, this pretty cool result, and I can 
hey, you know, this is just very nice uh, to be able to do uh, like on a smaller scale things that you know radar, uh, radio uh, astronomy labs are doing around the world. Okay, so that's the two projects. So let's, I'll talk a little bit about the. So I mean that's like the actual project that you can build. I want to talk about the project, the open source radio telescopes, just for a little bit. So they have a website and they have um, like instructions there and pictures, and you can follow this. And so um, they're actively like creating better instructions and manuals and kits, but they're also very responsive. And in particular, um, like people who ask questions where they show that they're interested but they have very little experience are very welcome on this mailing list. So. Like, if you go on that mailing list um, and uh, write, you know, I want to do this, it's awesome, I have no idea what you, like, promise you, you'll be well received and help through, through all the, you know, all the way through to completion. So, um, kudos to, um, you know, to the team for focusing, you know, primarily on, on like, beginners at the very, very lowest level. <clears throat> and here's a couple of people that you can contact directly if you want to get, um, involved in the project, um, but th they're also all on the mailing list. Okay, so, um, you know, I say lessons learned, because now again, like, these are not lessons I learned, these are lessons they learned, but I'm, I want to sort of, uh, I do want to bring this forward here, because I, I just love people getting involved in the educational sector. Um, yeah, so these um, projects might look simple, um, you know, at the at first glance, but it is a lot of work um, to come up with a sort of a kit and a whole project and a you know description of how to build something, um, you know, from scratch. So, um, but I, I'm glad they like you know took that all the way to completion, and now we have we have this to um, you know to spread the spread the word, and there's something we can use as projects ourselves if we are in the you know teaching sector. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of radio astronomy things you can do. Without like having you know access to the Arecibo uh, you know dish or something like that. So um, if you maybe you're already in a, interested in astronomy, I mean like not radio but your regular astronomy or your telescopes, and this is sort of a very nice uh, extension to that. And plus, you sort of trick people into learning all these engineering concepts, which is you know the whole point of this exercise. <clears throat> okay, there's a couple of people who were all involved in, in building these things. I might actually put it up again. I do have a couple more pictures here. So um, this is Ellie, who, who I worked with on this presentation. Um, you can see here Eve Klopp from um, um, Oregon Institute of Technology, I think so, with, with her students, you know, building one of those um, dishes, and they seem very happy. So, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back to this guy, and I'm going to, you know, ask you guys to give them a, a round of applause for putting this all together. So. <laughs> so we have some time for questions, and I will actually try and answer them as best. And Derek, uh, um, thankfully, who knows a lot more about actual radio astronomy than I do, has uh, agreed to help me with any questions. So yeah. Actually, I'm very glad that you connected this, because the first thing I did when I was reading the first program was to read them uh, and discuss about last your presentation about Iron Street Tesla. Oh, cool. So you mean for the uh, for the VLF signal, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, so I can I can say for a, I mean this is a bit of a, a for one it'll give it'll make the whole thing simpler because like it's the same solution for one way or the other. Plus the RTL SDR doesn't actually drive the price a lot. I think the ham it up might. I'm not quite sure how expensive they are. Thirty bucks. Yeah. So I mean it does add some cost. Um, like I don't know about 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 matching and everything. Like how do you get the antenna signal? Into your sound card, like well enough. Do you know? So Do you need an amplifier. Yeah, well, yeah. You need to like you need a different amplification circuit. That's for sure. I think it's just much easier to match a. I, you know, I'm just t completely like guessing here, but it's probably easier to match your antenna to an S RTLSCR than well, it is. In both cases, your, your <coughs> antenna has a huge impedance. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's.
Yeah. See, that's what I get for making stuff up on the spot. <laughs> I think uh, another part of the consideration was that it was an interchangeable component yeah, exactly. with the Hydrogen 1 antenna. Yeah. Um, and, and also its general purpose at that point, so you can show spectrum at other areas, and it's an extensible tool at that point. So if you have a student coming out of this saying, oh, this is awesome, what else can I do? It was like, oh, you can also run some, like, some, some other software, and boom, you do AIS or, or whatnot. So I think that's like the main advantage. I'm, Okay, and I'm, and I'm glad you, um, you got in touch with, uh, with those guys. Any, any other questions? That's just a remark. I did similar activities. We just hunt for a signal in a building. We just give them an SDR dongle, and you hide somewhere a signal, and you, they will discover about <coughs> what's happening in the RF. So like a scavenger hunt? Yeah, yeah. You just, like, uh, it's quite easy to do. Do you have, like, did you, like, talk? Is it, do you have, like, a blog post or something? Like, you can... So, like, cool, cool experiments don't have to be complicated. Um, I, I, I don't know how many people we've shown, like, FM demodulators with GNU Radio. And it's like, you know, every, every like, $20 radio can, has better FM reception than GNU Radio does if I don't, like, tweak the, the software. But it's just, like, the, the, you know, it's just way more tangible and people get, get excited about it. So, I, you know, I can, from my own personal experience, I can, I can say, uh, like, have people do simple experiments with SCR and, you know, many more people will enjoy it than you might expect. I think you had a question? No? Okay. Any others? So I'm not an expert in this, but are they planning to do something in the direction of synthetic aperture? Because like the antenna, right? You have the RF and that should be very nice to be sourced in the radio. So I don't know that they're doing that project. Yeah, I'm trying to speak into the microphone a little bit for the recording. Um, I don't know that they've done that, Actually, but there's certainly the question? their question is: uh, Are they considering doing a synthetic aperture um, or you know multi antenna uh, setup? And I don't know that they are. I kind of doubt it, uh, simply because the RTL SDR needs a lot of work before you can do that effectively, and the hardware that can do it effectively is more expensive. Um, but there are certainly many other people, uh, myself included, who have done things like that. Uh, Marcus Leach is an excellent resource if you look him up, um, and the the general term is te is interferometry uh, when you tend to speak about it with uh, uh, radio astronomy, and you can very effectively create a four antenna interferometry receiver and get very good results um, with all the kind of classic benefits that you get of improved uh, narrower beam width and, and physical resolution. Um, and it's, it's certainly something that you see with, uh, like, the square kilometer array and many of the professional radio astronomy setups. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are existing tools in GNU Radio and outside to do it. Um, and there's an entire radio astronomy, GNU Radio out of tree module, uh, to handle that. And it's, it's targeted interferometry. And just to, like, give, you, give a final thought, like, without having spoken um, to these guys, like, like, a synthetic aperture radar and interferometry, I, I would probably, like rate more like an undergraduate project, whereas they're really aiming at, like, put it, getting the bar down low. I mean, it, so. We have time for, like, one or two more questions. Okay, well then, uh, yeah. I'll throw out one comment. Uh, if you are looking for something to look in the sky, uh, pulsars are a very easy target, uh, 408 megahertz. Um, and one of the interesting things about them is because there are so many, most are not observed all the time. And so some, some very notable astronomy uh, conferences include works from just random people who have stared at a pulsar for a year and said, look at the data. Uh, and so um, that is a very interesting topic that can be done with like a tape measure Yagi and a very basic SDR. Okay. Well, thanks to these guys. Yep.